Hello and welcome to Forward. Our guest today is Dr. Yudail Mali, the founder and CEO of Cognitim. Cognitim is based in Petak Tikwa, Israel, and has been developing artificial intelligence technologies for robots for over 10 years, working with world leading companies on mapping, navigation, and autonomous decision making. Yuda holds a PhD in computer science, specializing in multi robot systems and is a leading expert on algorithms for robot autonomy. He spent seven years as a dean of the computer science school at Comas before starting Cognitim with his co-founder, Dr. Nahum Kaminka. Cognitim developed a unique set of robotic AI software, working with Intel, Amazon, Mitsubishi, Siemens, and other blue-chip companies. They have recently packaged this set of technologies in Nimbus, bringing a unique cloud-based robotic artificial intelligence solution in one easy-to-use platform. In this episode, we talk about why it takes many years to get an autonomous robot to market, how to speed this process up, what Cognitim learned about building robots from their work with Intel, Amazon, and DARPA, and what is the next big step for autonomous robotics as a field. We also talk about why having happy team members is important to Yehuda and what makes him feel like a dolphin. Yehuda, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Cognitive focus from the beginning has been on autonomous robots. What opportunity did you see there when you started Cognitive? And how has it evolved since then? So at the beginning, you know, I was a student doing a PhD in robotics. Okay, and under the computer science. And the opportunity that I saw there is, you know, that the robotic revolution is going to come and, and everybody will use robots. Robotic is not for a specific industry. There is no robotic industry. Robo- robots are entering to different industries. And they, this huge opportunity we saw and, and my knowledge allowed me to enter uh, to this field. And what do you think about the impact of the autonomous robots in the future how significant it's going to be for our society will it change it dramatically will it be just a small additional help here and there so actually i can't imagine the future without robots in anything you know in anything that we do even today that we have everything under our hands and still you do a lot of work that can be done by, by something else, okay? And we are also, as a, as a customers, want the things will, will happen quickly. Even when you order something on, on, on uh, Amazon or something like that, you want that everything will come to you quickly. And all the logistic change below, et cetera, is, is working autonomously to bring you, or part of the chain is autonomously ro- autonomous robots that can give you what you want, okay? And this is, for example, when you order something, but also look at our house. We have a washing machine, we have a disher, we have a lot of things, we have a cleaning robot, but still there are a lot of tasks in the house. And, and it's even this environment is not sufficient with the technology that we already have. And we can imagine that without robots, the future, okay? So absolutely in anything robots will enter, there is no question about it. It does make sense to move all the repetitive or all the mundane and boring tasks to the autonomous robots. So that sounds like a very exciting future for sure. At the same time, those working in the field know that it can take years to get a robotic product to market. What are the main challenges slowing down the innovation there and how do companies currently address them? So... Actually, this is this is the opportunity that we in Cognitim saw, because Cognitim was established in 2010. We do projects for different companies all over the world. Meaning, co- uh, companies that are developing an autonomous robot, they ask from us to specifically help them in, for example, uh, 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 building them a, a, a basic uh, building block for autonomy. For example, navigation, localization, mapping, etc. There are a lot of off-the-shelf of solutions. But when you really work and you want it to work as a product and not as a, you know, as a demo, 
that work as a product, you need to adjust those algorithms to your specific robot, to the hardware of the robot, the sensors, and anything. And that was our expertise in the from 2010 to 2020, 10 years of doing that those different algorithms for those companies. And what we really see that companies, most of their time and efforts are investing not in their core IP, meaning that they are developing the robots, they are developing the hardware of the robot, how the robot is look like, and the software and, and, and the sensors, etc. But in the software, they need to develop the autonomy solution of the robot, but also all the infrastructure of remote updates and upgrades, getting all the information and get insights from the robots. You want also to develop quickly. And to do all of that, the companies are actually, if you take 20 developers in a company, in a small company, 20 software developers that need to focus on the specific IP, on the specific algorithm that the robot needs to run, you will find one or two of them are actually working on on the IP. All the rest are trying to build the infrastructure to allow the robots to be uh, consistently, uh, to get updates, upgrades, getting insights, a lot of issues. And this is what we aim to, and this is what we developed from 2020 until now, is the ability is in an ecosystem called Nimbus that gives you all of these layers and make company really focus on their specific tasks. And, and because robotics is all about integration, and when robots are when companies are developing robots, they are not inventing everything from the robots. They think about the problem they wanted to solve, they design the robot how it should look like, but they are not building the, the motors for the for the wheels. They are not building the sensors, they are choosing off-the-shelf sensors, off-the-shelf motors, and building like off-the-shelf computing power and building their abilities, their their specific robot. Exactly, it happened also, we, we say that it's all about integration, all the connectivity to the cloud, all the, the monitoring that you want to monitor the robot, the analytics and the, the deployment is things that need to take as off-the-shelf, and this is what Nimbus is giving to it, it cognitive give it to its clients using the Nimbus products. Yeah, there is definitely multiple challenges, starting from integrating software and hardware, testing the robots first in virtual environment and then in real environment, and then deploying it, updating it, and maintaining it. All those things are hard if you don't have a great software package to simplify them and to standardize them. And developing such a package is a quite a hard task for any specific company. It doesn't seem feasible that any one company should develop this package for themselves. And nobody does it for the regular software. This type of software emerges for machine learning in general right now, which is called machine learning operations. And it just makes sense to have the same package for robotics. So Nimbus addresses these challenges. Can you walk us through the platform capabilities and how they map to the challenges we discussed? So Nimbus is, is, uh, is you enter to the Nimbus website, okay? You log in, you see a list of your robots, okay? In the list of your robots, you can drill, uh, you can separate them into fleets. For example, if you deploy robots in different play in different places in the world, different locations, so you can separate them into fleets. And if you drill down, for for example, for a specific robot, you have a few tabs that you can see all the information that the robot have, you know, the gen- general information, and also the specific, for example, the sensors, etc. You can build a configuration for the robots. You can share your own configuration of software, like also the part of, of developing the software we build also a, a, a easy way for drag and drop application that you can take the different dockers, you connect them with a simple GUI that you just drag and connect, and you take a rich library of algorithms that we developed at the last 10 years. And also we take a lot of off, off, the, off the shelf algorithms, for example, in ROS, for example, algorithms that NVIDIA developed is our partners from their uh, Isaac SDK. So you can, if you are using NVIDIA's on the edge computing, and you can easily use these huge, amazing algorithms by even just take them off the shelf and focus on your IP, meaning developing your own specific algorithm to your robot. And by that, you can 
build this configuration, check it in front of simulation that Nimbus also gives you a simulation environment that runs on, on your browser and not on the cloud. For example, if the programmer now, the, the robot hit you know, the edges, so you want to fix this line of code, you find this line of code, fix it, and check it in front of the simulation, the local simulation, but you don't need to install simulation because it's running your browser. So everything is easy uh, easy for development. And now when you are satisfying, but simply push a button and you can deploy this new software to a robot or to entire fleet. And by that you do an OTA over the air updates and you get and the robots are connected. You get all the informations, no, no matter where they're located. In the world, you get it in a nice da- dashboard. You can see, you can see all the streams from the robots. Also, you know the recordings. Your robot is working, and they are recording data. And then they, are, they if you choose by only toggle thing, and they are transmitting the data to the cloud. And also, you know all this mechanism. Company, if they are not using Nimbus, they need to develop this mechanism by themselves. For example how much information you want to record, what is the frequency of the information you want to record locally and where there is not enough room to send it to the uh, to the cloud, to delete from the cloud, all things, you know, all of these mechanisms are already solved in Nimbus and allows the developers and the companies to really focus on what they are doing on the software. And at the bottom line, what we say is instead of developing robot six years, because if you look on a startup, they raise money and they mostly came to, uh, to, 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 their, to their VCs or NGL, etc., and they show a small demo. And, you know, in robotics, it's easy to do demos. Three months, four months, you take a few things from Ross and you say, hey, amazing, we do it in three months. No, let's think what will be happening in about additional three months. And then you enter to this desert that takes you six years. Because... You're actually selling hardware. You're shipping hardware, a robot. And you don't want that the robot will, will stack or something like that. You want always to be connected with your robot. So what we allow here is from six years, what we see a lot of companies, this is the average time it takes from the initial idea until deployment. And using Nimbus, we can say, we say, we, you can decrease it to one and a half years. And actually, one of our clients that start when we start developing Nimbus, okay, as a beta site, we have a few abilities, not all the abilities that we have today. And today, it's only past one and a half year, and now they're in the, the deployment in, in, you know, different clients over the, the world. They are located in the United States. So in a real environment, and not as a demo, as a client that buy those their robots, and they implement they implement the robots in in the specific environment. So that's that is a main a main you know advantage that we give to our client. Focus on yeah, your sure. IP and develop quickly. And what industry or work type of use case that robots support your beta customer? Nurse uh, around nursing it's hospitals. Gotcha. Okay, so you. Built Nimbus to maximize modularity and interoperability, allowing developers to choose which parts they will leverage from off the shelf, which parts they will build. Yeah, we allow them this flexibility. You can take whatever you want. You don't need to take hours. You can take whatever you want and enter it to Nimbus. And it's, of course, in your space. Nobody sees it. As an organization, you are the only one that can see the, the, the modules that you upload to the system. The issue is, it's actually you are not uploading it to the system. You just, you know, you have a file that tell him, tell this file where to download this, uh, the, the code to the robot. But what we allow in Nimbus and we, we make our uh, library rich and richer because now you are, you don't, you want a localization, a, a mapping algorithm. You say maybe Gmapping is good for me. Maybe Hector Slam is good for me. Maybe uh, different Slam algorithms. Okay. So, you want to do a check, a quick check. So you take this module in Nimbus, deploy, check the influence. You say, okay, now let's check the additional, the, the another one. You can really understand, okay, this kind of algorithm is, is good for me. Now I can change it a bit. I can now make it to work better in my algorithm, in my robot. But it helps you to really understand 
what's good, uh, what will be better for your robot. And of course, you can intervene and do whatever you want. And of course, build your own uh, models. We don't think that we can give all the source code to all the companies in the world, of course. There is so many innovation happening and so many new vendors coming up with new modules that it would be very limiting to have developers work only with one set or with one vendor instead of uh, the flexibility of choosing different pieces from different vendors. And making those pieces work together uh, is the job of Nimbus. How do you think about building partnerships with hardware and software vendors in this space? I think this is the, the natural way for us to work, okay? To do partnership. That if, for example, we have partnership with NVIDIA, with uh, for computing companies, for example, NVIDIA, all the edge devices we supported, you know, the, the Jetson, now the Orin also, with Aeon, with Edelink, with Seed, all of those manufacturers were working, you know, and supporting their uh, computing. So any clients that will want to to use their, their, their computing on the edge, just download Nimbus and automatically you recognize everything and you can start working easily. In addition to that, we also have partnership with sensors companies, okay, that build sensors, build leaders, build cameras, etc. And, and they are entering to our ecosystem. So you can easily, you know, add to your robot, I want this camera, I want this real sense, I want this RP leader, my robot, etc. And you actually drag it and put it in the exact location in a 3D way of how your robot is modeled. And you put the exact and how the sensor is look like and the driver of the sensor already inside. Okay? So you just need to drag and attach them to your robot using Nimbus in a 3D environment. Do you expect more of those partnerships that you just mentioned coming over the next years? Absolutely. Yeah. All, all, every month went a few, a few additional uh, partners. Okay. And you also worked with, as you mentioned, with multiple customers, including Intel, Amazon, and Siemens before building Nimbus. So how did that work instruct your approach to building this platform? So that's example of working with different clients, and and that what we we made you we've been you know a project based company. Okay, so we do projects, okay, and and what we see in this project that most of the time is setting the environment, setting the everything together, and and we see that we repeat in any project we repeat this process over and over, and that's one of the the most time consuming, and. That was the actual idea of developing Nimbus. And we understand that any company now need to, to go to this, uh, to this route, okay? And after the, the software is ready, now you have all the layers when you are in deployment that you need to give a support to your client. And if there is a problem in the robot, you don't want to send a technical person. You really want to understand this problem. Okay, you want to, if if you have a hot fix that you can send to the robots and and fix the issues by software, it it saves you a lot of of time and money, and also to get insight on the business and to understand if there are clients that actually buy from your robots and they are not using the robots, so, so probably there could be a problem that you can understand from your sales guy if you give them you know the eyes that they can actually control the the product and and take it to the right way. Right. And in your work with customers, what do you see businesses maybe misunderstand or underappreciate about implementing autonomous robotics? What are the common mistakes and how do they hurt the implementation of the projects? So, you know, it's, it really depend, depend on the business, depend in the area where they are uh, focused. Maybe, you know, some areas, the main concern is, is safety. If you are, you know, driving a truck, it's in autonomous cars, etc. is the safety. Autonomous cars today have most of the abilities and, and the autonomy and the safety is the one of the main issues there. This is an example of, of one thing. The additional thing is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the ROI. Companies need to really understand how much money they need to invest, okay, in, in order to return this investment. Also, it really changes. I, I don't say think that they have a, a one answer for all the this, uh, this environment or these areas. Yeah, sure. And if we kind of zoom out a little bit, what do you think 
in general holds back the autonomous robots proliferation in our world. We have vacuum cleaners, we have pool cleaning robots, some security robots, some others, but very few. We cannot say that it's mainstream yet. Safety is one of the unsolved problems, as you mentioned, in deploying more autonomous robots. What are the other unsolved problems in autonomous robotics? No, I think that we have different clients that actually not only what you say. For example, we have a company called Robodeck, an Israeli company called Robodeck. They're building robots for maintaining decks. Okay, you have a deck in your house and it's to maintain it and to keep it shiny like, like it's new. You never see decks like that. Okay, but if you're buying their, your, their robots, the robot is every one week goes around your deck, put a thin layer of oil, and your deck is always look like a new one. This is an example of robotic solution. In 2016, we, Cognitim, established a company now and, and called Blade Ranger, okay, together with Asaf Freeler. And, and, and this, this company are actually building robots for cleaning solar panels in the solar fields. So here you can really easily understand the ROI. If your panels are not clean, your solar field entering less energy, meaning less money. So any <laughs> any place that you can find, you will find robots, autonomous robots. Also in constructions, you know, robots that painting the, the, the walls in the when building new apartments. A lot of different clients that we are working with. Okay, and, and we really see because we are reaching out to those companies, out them reaching out to us, and you really see the, the amazing minded of people of inventing new robotic solution, and you, we, we really see this coming, the robotic revolution. So maybe today you see vacuum cleaner, robot pools, and, and robo mowers. Uh, but you know, you uh, and most of the people also hear about industry uh, robots in warehouses moving things, but there are much more and more different solutions that is now is under under you know development and are going to go out. You feel like we overcame the major barriers, the major limitations that held us back in the previous years, and now we're ready to deploy autonomous robots on a massive scale. And that's why, because, you know, sensors are being very, very cheap today. If you look at 3D LiDAR seven years ago, it cost around $60,000. Today you can buy it in around $1,000, $1,500. So this is amazing. And, and com- also computing that being smaller, more efficient, more, more powerful and cheaper. So all of those are, are enabled to build the robots that, that and of course, the, the progress in AI, etc., allows us to build smart robots and, and, and with decent prices. That's definitely a very optimistic view of the field. And it is supported by the trends in the industry, a decline in sensor prices, growing compute power, and improving AI algorithms as well. It looks like we're ready to deploy the autonomous robots in environments where safety is less of an issue. We're good for warehouses, good for the use cases like solar panel cleaning and deck cleaning. Maybe not there yet for autonomous cars on the roads as the safety requirements are much higher. Or how do you think about the safety requirement as a major limitation? I think it should be a limitation where there are people, so no question about it. But if you look, you know, on closed places or, you know, on agriculture, well, you can barely find people there, okay? So that's the place where a big robot will be able to drive. They are, for example, they are dangerous, but those are places that they can drive on. And this is the way the technology is going to enter. After it will be, and the main, main issue in robotics is robot robustness. Okay, to make sure that you go to sleep at night and you have a robot that's working 24-7 and it's working and you are really sure that nothing happened, okay? And you ask your programmers, are you really sure? And they tell you, yeah, we're really sure. And everybody go to sleep at night. Then you understand you are quite robust. What limits the robustness of robots and how Nimbus helps 
to make sure that your robots that you deployed are robust? Nimbus can't, can't, can't ensure that because actually it runs part of the code. It runs the code that you write. By the infrastructure itself that it's connected and say I'm connected, I'm not connected, and, and the Nimbus agent that installed in the robot has all the robustness ability as the fail the fail safe that he have to connect to the server. But mm, sometimes you know you are not fully connected, it's robotics. You don't have the internet connectivity, the robot's working autonomously. And and it really depends on the code that you run. What we are now entering to Nimbus is also an anomaly detection layer that you barely can find it in robotic application because it takes a lot of time to develop. And, and, and you say, everybody say it is important, but they don't have the time to invest. That. For example, if your robot is now working, an anomaly detection algorithm that runs and always listen to the sensor and how the system is working and can find, find and after it learns the system, how it works, it can try to find some anomalies. For example, if now the anomaly detection algorithm, when it learned the, 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 the system, find that the camera, the, the image compress algorithm is compressing the camera amazingly. Okay? So this is not a usual thing. So maybe the, maybe the camera is full of dust, full of dust. So that's a thing that you cannot say, oh, okay, there is an anomaly in my system and you get the trigger on that. And probably, maybe, you know, everything is working, the code is right, but you need to clean the sensor, okay? So those kind of things that you even not think, you, you try to think on everything when you, you, you are implementing the software, but always sometimes came up. So if you have these layers of AI that learns your, your, your platform, okay, and how it, it should work, you can, the, the, the platform could be, the robot could be more safe and, and robust. And that's that thing of mechanism we are also now entering to Nimbus as a layer, as an AI-based layer layer that will be as a basic in the Nimbus agent that run on the platform. We can call it taking the experience of multiple customers deploying robots and all the challenges they face uh, to in- enable robustness and implementing them in Nimbus to save time to every new customer that will also face the same issues eventually. And they will be excited that yeah. someone thought about them and implemented the tools to address them so they don't have to build those tools in-house. Exactly. Okay, sounds good. Let's talk now about origins of Cognitim. You were a dean of the computer science school before starting the company. And during that time, you actively researched various aspects of robotics and published multiple papers. One of the most prominent themes was your work on SLAM. Why did you choose this area for research? For my actually, uh, I actually used SLAM. The core research was on a team of robots that working together, teamwork, and in, in algorithms for teamwork, for example, in patrolling, my PhD was in patrolling of team of robots that working in an area or on fences, etc. So how the robots should work together, allocate tasks, so the mechanism of allocating tasks, etc. And also in the aspect of the algorithm, one robot is shutting down because when you say multiple robots working together, it makes the mission most, more robustness. It's not a single point of failure. So how the, the team can overcome on problems that can arrive. And that's what fascinating me when I do the, the research as a PhD student. And if you want me to tell you about my, my history, so as a PhD, I learned computer science. When I, in the middle of the PhD, I also teach in a, call, in a college called College of Management. They have a computer science school there. I teach them a computer science in parallel to the PhD. When I finished the PhD, I started Cognitive together with uh, Nahum Kaminka, Dr. Nahum Kaminka. And for, you know, we started as a garage. So I still work at the college in parallel. And in, in the money that I get from the college, I, you know, pay for the new employees that actually was my friends from the lab, okay, from the same robotic lab. And we together, you know, work a day and, and programming at night. Okay, and we started do project. In, a, in addition to that, then they asked me also in the college, in parallel to Cognitive, 
also to be the dean of the computer science school, which became the biggest computer science school in Israel. We have 1,700 students. And that helped me also to take the best students in my class and tell them, if you, you, if you will be the best student in this class, you will work at Cognitive. And you know, to work at your professor or your, your, your lecturer, it's wow. Okay, so I have the privilege to take the best students and, and to enter them to uh, Cognitive. And actually, Cognitive now, we have 32 employees. Around half of them are my graduates. Interesting. So this is a wonderful pipeline of uh, new potential employees for the company. I understand that in Israel, robotics is now a quite thriving field. Uh, A lot of companies there. I imagine there is some competition for the talent as well. So having this unfair advantage of being able to recruit your students seems like a very important thing. And about the first customers, where those come from? How did you get your garage operation in front of customers and convince them to give you a chance to do work for them? It was really difficult because what you have, you have one person and a half, okay, and that's all. But actually, we signed a contract with one of the biggest companies in Israel called called, uh, Israel Aerospace Industries, and, and they wanted, you know, a teamwork. And we have the background from the Academy of Teamwork. So they actually wanted our knowledge also to help them. And we say, okay, we work from Cognitive to help them. And, and that was the, the first time that we do a project. And when you work with a big company, the other companies look at you as a series. Okay? And that's the way that actually we started to do project, different projects. I got you. So that was a lucky break for you to find that first very well-known and established customer and then use their brand to convince other customers. That's a wonderful way if you can do that, that's for sure. Did you have any challenges convincing that first well-known company to let you work for them or it was through some network, you already knew them? How did that work start it? Actually, I already knew them because when I was a student, we do a project together with them with the lab. Okay, from the lab. That, uh, so I have the relations with the managers. And, and when we, I finished the studies, I, I proposed them. I proposed them at, uh, and asked them exactly about their problems and how we can help them. And we actually started to develop a teamwork engine for a robots. And, and they wanted to use it, check this teamwork, and through this teamwork engine, we do a project, and so on. So now, 10 years into being a CEO and founder of a company, how did this role change you personally? Actually, it didn't change me at all. Sorry for the answer. But I'm the same kid that I was. Okay, so so I'm a person that, you know, like, like love the life, okay? Have to enjoy, have I have to sit with friends. And this is also important for me for when I'm entering new employees in cognitive. I want to be, to see their smiles. I want to see that they, they have life, that we are working here and there is a life here, but they should always have their own life, okay, and enjoy from everything that they are doing. And if you sit with, you know, a set people, you know, and, and you find those people, maybe they could be brilliant. But you speak with them and there is no passion. And they are brilliant. It will not fit for us. Okay? So this is a way that we we build our culture in cognitive. Okay? So, for example, every day, 7 p.m., we sit outside and drink beers. Why? Because, like, a cultural thing. I got you. We'll talk a little bit more about the team culture later in the interview. But I like the idea of 7 p.m. beer, for sure. (laughs) Uh, How would you position your company on a scale from pure research to pure applied AI? We began as a pure research, but we today fully applied. We have our research scientist, Dr. Eliyahu Khalasci, is an expert in machine learning and anomaly detection. This was his PhD on anomaly detection, okay? And he leading the research. But what we are doing is really focus on applying AI and, and building AI to companies. 
Several years ago, you participated in the DARPA challenge. Yeah. Uh, what was it about and why did you decide to take part? So we actually uh, do, a comp- there was an Israeli group that competed in this competition. It was uh, three companies, no, two companies and four academies. Okay, in the companies, it was the Israeli Aerospace Industry, the biggest one, one of the biggest companies, and also community, and uh, also a different uh, academia. And together, we build, you know, we, we build a fully autonomous kit for the humanoid robot that need to do all the mission in the DARPA challenge. And that was fascinating. You know, we look at it as a project for us. It's not like a product when we still was a project-based company. Today, if you ask me, I was not, uh, I, I will not, competing in those kind of competition because we are mostly focused on our product to build it, to make it more robust and, and, and edit more abilities. Uh, but when we was, when we were, you know, in, 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 a, in the state of mind of a project company, we look at it all as a project. Did it give you something, some experience that also helped and instructed how you built Nimbus? Yeah, it's also, yeah, also, you know, the simulation that was problematic to work with. Or, uh, also, how to synchronize the teams, because it was a teams of six uh, institutions, two companies, four academy. So how you sync the code, how you build all the software in Nimbus, today you can share it. You build a co- one configuration and you share it with your teammates. And everybody can add the save different versioning of the configuration on the robot, do the experiments together, share the robot with others, no matter where they are sitting over the world. Okay. So that's also was one of the lessons learned of how to raise work and development in robotics for different teams that not only sit together in the same room. Now switching to the team that you're building at your company, when hiring new members today, what do you look for beyond as you mentioned before, that they should be excited about what they do. So what else do you look for in a new potential team members and when the candidate is clearly not a good fit? Mm -hmm. So first, the important thing, as I told you, they need to be happy. Then they have to be modest, have to be modest and fascinating from technology. Okay, they have to love technology because if you have somebody that loves technology, anything that you will give him, he will be able to he will be able to deliver because he love it because he will not sleep at night until he will solve the problem and he is enjoying it. okay and uh, of course additional thing is to be a teamwork player in cognitive to do you know all the covid and, and a lot of companies work from remote etc in cognitive we always work from the office and and we, we, we what part of our interviews is to understand that this person is prefer to work from office than from home, okay? So currently today, four week, four days we are working from office and one day from home. And you see that in the day that working from home, half of the people are actually arriving to the company because they love to work together. And I think this is very important because you are now solving something and then you say, hey, this is your own back, come and see it. And, and you, you, are, you are entering from home to room and, and it's fun and, 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 and you can easily solve problems while you are all together sitting in the same building, in the same floor. The teams who hire remote members usually bring up as the main reason for that the access to the talent outside of maybe their town of uh, residence. And this is a trade-off. You either go remote and then can have access maybe globally, or you stay with your team co-located in one office, and then you somewhat limit your access to talent. So you decided that co-location is more important than access, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is it because Israel has a quite dense population and uh, you believe you still have enough talent So you don't have to go remote or do you see at some point when Cognitive grows, you will exhaust the available talent that can be co-located and you will have to branch into going remote? Yeah, I believe in some stage we will also hire from remote. But currently now we are quite small 
to be, it, and it's really, you know, the efficiency here is really, really important because we want to, to see the progress every day, every week, and in any sprint that we are doing any two weeks, okay? So if all the people are together, we see the progress very, very good. I, I'm sure that also to take a huge talent, you know, outside could also benefit, but he will he will not feel the culture. He will not feel what we are feeling here. And I think it's influence on your own. It definitely does. What is your recipe to build a highly effective team and how that instructs the culture you build in at Cognitive Team? Uh, the recipe, you know, is first, I'm the first interviewer, okay? Need to find to write people's, I think one of my strengths, okay, is really to understand people. By speaking two words, understand who this kind of people, person, the personality, and, and, and that's why I'm not doing, you know, the technical interview. The technical interview are, are the, with the department, the head of the department that this person is going to be, okay? But really to understand the personality is really important for, for us because you can find amazing person, a talent, and he is amazing and could fit exactly to different culture, different company. But for us, it will not fit. And if it will not fit for us in the culture, it's like, you know, a hot pepper that you, you feel it, you put, small, you put a, a bit of it and you feel it in all the, the cook. So exactly like that. So he will not be satisfied. He will not be happy. And he will start, start speaking with that. And, that, and it, you will feel something like political issues in your company. Okay? So... Choosing the right people in the personality is the first thing because before what they are known. After that, there are all the technical issues. And this, I think, keep company happy and, and always wanted to meet together and, and work together. So selecting the right people for the team is the most important component of building a highly effective team. Also, the other component you mentioned is to make sure that those people are happy with what they're doing right now. So this third one is co-locate them, as far as I understand, so to make sure that they work together, communicate intensively, and kind of learn from each other, and the whole, that cohesiveness growth of the team. And of course, to be modest. This is also one of the main key. Interesting. That focus on modesty does it come from some experience of uh, working with people who did not have that quality? Not, you know, not in cognitive, in different places. Okay, I see that one of the, the, the issues, you know, if, if person is not modest, now he, the other people try to, to answer to show that he is, he is also a bit no better than him and then start, you know, an ego, an ego thinks that ruin everything. Ego competition. Yeah, I can see how it can grow starting from some seed one good friend of mine talks about the types of issues that each person brings to the team with a seed for a crystal and how crystals grow from one seed so if the seed is has these specific qualities that you don't want to have on your team and the team is small then from that seed those Unwanted qualities will grow like a crystal grows from one small first item and will take over part of your team and will make the team less efficient. So you don't want to have the seeds at the very beginning so they don't grow into fully grown crystals of uh, unwanted behavior later on. Okay, sounds good. That sounds like a great recipe. And your personal passion outside work lies with free diving <laughs> it's for everyone it's diving 100 feet without any equipment so curious how did you become interested in this activity so you know when i was young i do a course for di diving course sportive diving course like it but then i say i really like to see really like to dive but all the logistics to put the 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 suite the diving suit to take all the, 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 the equipment and then to rest between dive to dive and to fill the, 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 the tank. So it's taking a lot of time and logistic and 
hey, I came to enjoy, not to work. Okay? So I do snorkeling, and then I started to go down, and then started to go down, and then I see a, a person that goes something like 15 meters, okay, with, with his big fins. Okay, I say, oh, okay, what is that? This is a free diving. And then I started, you know, to be addicted. And how long do you spend underwater these days? It depends on the depth. Okay, but if I do something like, you know, in a swimming pool, around three minutes, something like that, this is a regular swimming. But if you do a deep dive, for example, 30 meters, it's one minute and you're up. One minute. And you're up. Yeah, it's, you just to, to see something interesting and go up. The fascinating thing in that is you actually feel like a dolphin. You enter to the water, see things go up, take a breath and go and continue diving and you can do it all day. This is the amazing thing. It does sound like something amazing, something that gives you a new dimension to your freedom. That lets you experience something that you never can experience above the water. But still holding your breath for three minutes sounds like some remarkable achievement. I'm curious, what's the secret to holding your breath for so long? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't practice too much. You know, do it. And, and by, by diving all, way, all the time, you get the practice by itself. I didn't, you know, do a practicing, take courses or something like that. Maybe because I'm also running, you know, and when you run, you have enough air and, you know, maybe this is a reason, but it's not, you know, I'm not a professional, okay? This is a hobby. I see. You liked it so much so that it came natural to you to develop the necessary yeah. skills. Sounds good. Turning to the future now. What are your goals for Cognitim long term? First is that Nimbus will come, you know, the, the ecosystem and a brand of choice for any robotics company, any robotic application, that any robot like Intel, say, Intel inside. So any robot that you will see, you will say Cognitim inside. That sounds like a great vision for the company. And for the last question, let's talk about the evolution of AI and robotics. What are you looking forward to there and what concerns you? I'm looking for, you know, that you will need less developed software to your robot, meaning that the robot will actually learn to, you see all the AI is came today, focus on today is, is a training on, on video and understanding the perception, mostly in the perception, okay, understanding the world, okay? But you see less work on the decision-making. Now I get all this information, what should I do? And, and to do a very sophisticated robot, you need to write a lot of code to any case and, and to build it in different, there are different uh, decision-making software or architectures to do that. But the AI, the fascinating, and what I'm interested more in is how to take those decisions autonomously, learn the mission by, by itself, by, by, by learning. You see a lot of you know, works now today of how robot dogs or, or locomotions like learn to work by themselves, etc. but not the mission, what to do. And this is, the, I think, going to be really the next step of allowing the robots to learn by itself the mission. This is uh, a next very important step uh, for robotics, for sure. I just recently read the paper called, I believe, Say Can by the team at Google, where they use their language model, Palm, to generate steps from the free text instruction. So the person tells, hey, I spilled some water on my table. Can you help me clean it up? And then a robot applies a little language model to break this question into a set of steps. And then it uses the library of functions it can do. For example, it can navigate to some point, can pick up some object. So the language model would, will break down the request to, okay, navigate to a place, to a, say, a drawer, open it, find a sponge, pick it up, bring the sponge to the person. And then it will map those instructions to the functions of the robot, and the robot will go and do that. 
obviously, if there is no such function within the library of functions, it will just send back the common to uh, the language model to say, okay, I cannot do that. Try to redo the set of instructions. Language model will redo the set of instruction from that point on. And that way... Build the plan. Yeah, build the plan. And rebuild the plan until it only has the function that robot supports. And then they show that these robots actually at 80% of tasks, it can deliver. The tasks are fairly simple, but it can deliver on them with this strategy. It's an interesting, it's a first attempt, of course. They admit that there is a lot of limitation to that approach, but it's interesting how they use the language model to come up with a plan and then map that plan to the functions of the robot and take it from there. So actually, if you are you know, saying that, we're actually now in the middle of a consortium. We get a fund from a consortium in Israel called Human-Robot Interaction. There are a few companies, robotics companies and a few academies, that we are building a human-robot interaction toolkit. So because we believe in the robotic revolution and we believe that a lot of robots will be around us, and the robot needs to know how to behave around people. So we build all this toolkit, autonomy toolkit, that allows company to easily develop an interaction with people. For example, you have a robot that, that drives on a corridor, okay, and then he sees people. If he will understand that the people are afraid from him, he will already speed. He will go a bit uh, to the right when if they are in on left, okay? If he will find that there are, you know... They see him and they're not afraid of him, uh, so he can drive faster. And, and he can also learn and ask, for example, one of the problems in robotics, you need to develop the mission that will be 100 percentages. But, for example, if we have now a logistic robot that needs to send a delivery to a specific building and the robot don't get a GPS signal, you lose his location. Why not ask people? Why not ask, where should I go to this street? And now the people will say, ah, you should go right. And the robot will understand this is right. Okay, I see this, this, uh, this, uh, the, the, the movement of the hand, etc. And what happened if we will tell him, go to right, and he will point to left. So the robot will find contradiction here. He say right, but he point left. So maybe I will ask additional person. Maybe I will ask him again. Okay, so a natural interaction with people, this is what, we are actually developing, and is all of this consortium are going to add this code as a modules in Nimbus, as also modules in ROS, and also modules in Nimbus. So you can easily drag, drop, deploy, check in your application. That sounds like a fascinating line of work for sure, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the results of that work and those uh, modules. It's definitely going to be great. Yehuda, uh, thank you for coming to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present in Cognitive and Nimbus. To everyone listening, please sign up for Nimbus demo and check it out. You should also follow Yehuda on LinkedIn. The links will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening.